Hi, so uh, thanks for sticking around. Um, my name's Adam Hall. I'm a researcher here at the Block Presidenti Lab. Um, and I'm looking at big data privacy. Um, and big, big data privacy sort of came about in the last couple of years. It really sort of came to a head when GDPR came out. Um, and it's about sort of reversing the bad assumptions around big data practices. Usually, these um, architectures form out of um, sort of a priority on profit for large businesses or any sort of business who's building a model, which isn't necessarily bad, but it is bad if it comes at the expense of privacy. So, as I say, I'm here at the Block Presidenti Lab in Napier. It's a Merkiston campus. Um, I'm the Open Mind Meetup host for Edinburgh and the national lead um, for Scotland. And I'm a researcher with AFERIS AI, which is a German company for privacy preserving machine learning in healthcare. So roughly what we want to cover today is the basic like, generic deep learning process at like, the most low le or high level possible, um, because it's important for making sense of some of the things that come later on. Um, and we're going to cover basically the architecture of a centralized machine learning model and where the data can leak out from that. We're then going to look at black box model attacks and sort of challenge some of our notions of what is a secure architecture traditionally and what isn't. Um, and look at differential privacy and how we can use differential privacy to fix some of these problems. So, first of all, the generic deep learning process. There we go. So, if we take the most simplistic database that we can possibly think of, and that's just that, um, what, that was sort of created out of an AND condition. So, then AND condition is only ever true if both the preconditions are true. So, here we have 1, 1, and 1 at the very, very bottom is the only true condition. And we can turn this into a data set of x and y values. So the x values are the inputs, and the y values are the outputs, or the labels. And we just twisted it 90 degrees, and it sort of fits in that nice cylinder. So we feed these x values into a model, which is really just a set of parameters, so a set of weights and a set of biases. When we feed x values in, we take every input coming into each weight um, and then for each node and then add a bias value and put this through an activation function. We then compute our error. So in this case, we have, um, oh, sorry, I'll go back and just explain a little bit more. So our prediction when it's separate from the actual labels, we just refer to that as y hat. So we would usually have a set of y hat values, which is in this case, four predictions all being one, and we have our actual labels, which are y. So the idea is we want to compute our loss by just taking the sum um, of all of the, the errors and dividing that by the number of instances we have. So in this case, our loss rate would be about 0 0.75, as three out of four of our predictions are incorrect. And we use this error to, to create a um, the next sort of step in learning, which is trying to fix our model to improve upon it. So we use our error function with something called backwards propagation um, to, to sort of find out which direction we need to step to make it better. So we use gradient descent, and that's just uh, the chain rule in, differ in differential calculus. And we use a computation graph, which we can sort of generate from the functions which our data goes through before it hits this y hat value. So that's all we need to know. And all we need to really worry about here for later on is that we know what these gradients are, which is just this, the direction that we need to step in order to improve our model. So in traditional models like centralized learning, we have a researcher and we have sort of citizens with data. They send their data to this researcher and he aggregates it and trains his model with this data. Any second now. Oh. And at the end of it, he's got a model and some data. And usually what he'll do is he'll sell the model to some um, corporation or the use of this model to a corporation and get somebody. And that's a conventional, sort of accepted and quite OK business um, sort of model.
But in some cases, they might sell the data as well. And that's been fairly commonplace for like the last couple of years. But GDPR means that this can't really happen without the consent of Alice, Bob, and Claire. And then he might also get hacked. Someone might get into his systems and just take the data. And this happens literally all the time. We maybe like, I don't know, a couple of times a month, we hear of some new big data breach. So this is another way that we can leak the information from Alice, Bob, and Claire's um, data without, uh, once it's left their hands. The data could also get requested by an authority. And that's probably not so bad in the UK at the moment. But in, if, if you belong to a certain demographic, which is not favored by the dominant regime, then that can be potentially fatal. So we have seen how bad practices can um, sort of leak information about people who give their data to be trained on. But then, so what, what, would, what would be like our ideal case then if we don't share the model and we don't share the data, we just have this black box model which we train a private database on and allow Bob access to some kind of API. And he puts his data into this API and gets back some kind of outcome prediction, some Y value or Y hat value, with a certainty factor. Are we still secure? No. This, this um, certainty factor can actually leak a lot of information about the underlying database. So first of all, we look at the membership inference attack, which is where we have two very similar databases. And I want to know if my database A has any instances which are contained in database B. And we can actually do this. Um, and all that we need is, and this is based on a couple of assumptions, we need to know approximately the architecture of the black box model which we want to try and um, reverse engineer. And we also need to have uh, some kind of sort of the synthetic database which is a similar to the one that the model was trained on. So in terms of the, the, sim the model of similar architecture, we want an ensemble of these. So it's just, we call it the shadow, um, the shadow classifier. And it's just one to n. We can choose as many as we want in this ensemble. Um, so it's approximately the same in terms of architecture, but not necessarily the, the parameters of the black box model. And we do a synthetic database. And how do we pick our database if we have absolutely no idea of the values of the secret one? Well, what we can actually do is we can game the model <laughs> that we have access to to give us probability factors back. And what we can do is we can explore the entire input space that this model can address. And then the plausible values will come back with a high confidence factor. And we just sample from this subset, which is inside the greater multidimensional input space, and create this synthetic database. It doesn't need to be exactly the same as the, the previous database, just approximately similar. We can then split that into a train set and a test set. And we train our shadow ensemble, which is just a, an array of different class, or an array of classifiers, which have been trained slightly differently, um, on, the, on, the, on the training data. And if we perform a prediction on the test data, we have our output and our certainty factor. So we do that. And we do the same again for our training partition. And the idea is we get another output and a certainty factor. But the assumption is that the certainty factor of the training data that has been passed to the model previously will come back with a much higher certainty factor, or be much greater than those it's just encountered. And that's the main assumption that we use to do this membership inference attack. And then what we, can, what we can do is we have our data set A, which doesn't have um, instance four, um, or sorry, which doesn't have instance, um, which has instance one, two, and three, and shares instance two and three with data set B. And we can add um, more features to this. So we can add the feature of the output and the certainty factor, and we also know which data our shadow ensemble has seen and which it hasn't. 
So we can also add this label, which is either a true or false. Was it in our training partition? And this creates our attack data set. We can then train a new attack model of our own specification. <coughs> Oops. Um, and yeah, we are looking again to, as an adversary, figure out if a data, piece of data that we are privy to is in this private data set, which was used to train this black, uh, black box model. So we send in our input that we think we want to we want to find out whether that's a member of that set. And we receive back an output uncertainty factor. And that matches the features of our newly created database. And the idea is that we've already trained this model to um, be able to tell a difference in a range of approximated models um, between the training partition and the non-training partition, the test partition. And the idea is we can do the exact same thing. We can apply this exact same um, mechanism to the black box model. So next, we have another attack that we can do on black box, which is model inversion. And the idea is we have this similar database A to database B. So there are, what, three features in common, or two features in common. Yeah, C, D. Uh, we have our um, variable which we want to sort of approximate, which is E, and we have our output. So we train on model B, and yeah, we sort of get this, the idea is we can, with database A and the trained model B, just the outputs, we can approximate E. And this is actually works in practice. You can see um, the picture on the top left um, is from a paper that I've been looking at recently. So they had an output class, which was just a name, and there's only one name which matches to any one face. So using a similar technique, they um, had the name, and they were able to reverse back and get an approximation of the face to that name. And the way that this works is like relatively intuitive. If we were to join um, the data sets together so we can put in um, our instance two and try and figure out, that, like, figure out what that is, then we know the output, we know the certainty factor, we know A, B, and C. Um, and this said we've already used the previous technique, uh, membership inference, to ascertain that this is actually in our set. We can just tweak this E that we want to approximate up and down and see how that affects the certainty factor. If it goes up, that means we're getting closer to our mark. So how do we fix this? Right, don't publish the confidence values. That seems really, really simple. But then what if the confidence values are useful? What if it leads into a subsequent um, processing that, that actually relies on knowing how accurate this um, result is expected to be? So then we, we have this trade-off between like, privacy or we have model utility. And we can make this slightly more nuanced if we just round to a significant figure. We don't take off the, the, the confidence uh, factor completely. We just round it to, say, like a second decimal point. But even then, we're, we're sacrificing some utility. So there's this other method that we can use called differential privacy. So if you're not a statistician, then this will look quite jarring. So what we'll do is we'll just go through every part of this and try and figure out um, what it actually means. So first of all, differential privacy isn't any one mechanism. It's just a proof which allows you to verify um, with some metric what the privacy of a function is. So first of all, what's this? This just means a Hamming distance of one. So what does that mean? It means just that we have two databases, one with uh, an instance missing. So we have ABC and so on, and then we have ABD missing C and so on. So that's what the Hamming distance of one means. And this basically just means how much is our function going to differ um, if we just remove one instance? How sensitive is it to this being removed? So um, if we just go through this, we have a probability on the left and we have a probability on the right. So 
the output of our function when operating on da data set D, um, so the probability of this, in the range of all probable outputs, all possible outputs of S. So this is, let's say, like we were looking for a classification of rainy, mild, sunny. Our range of possible outputs, would, that, that would be our S, rainy, mild, sunny. And then we're saying that this is multi multiplicatively close um, by a factor of epsilon. And this just means that the difference between those, these two functions is a matter of amplitude and not, um, yeah, you'll see in a second. <laughs> um, so then we have um, the function um, operating on d prime, which is just the result that we get in this case, for any um, potential value in the range s. And basically what we're saying is, um, if asked as a query on d, then the result of this query is going to be approximately the same as the result of the database if she hadn't done this query. So when we talk about this multiplicative difference, um, we want to create a difference in private um, algorithm or function. And what we want is for these two functions to map out like this. So on the left-hand side, we can see um, D. It's, it's slightly more probable that the prediction came from D or the output came from D. But it's still plausible that it could have come from D prime. And on the um, right, we can see it's slightly more plausible that it came from D prime as opposed to D. Um, and this is good. And this is like a good definition if we have two functions which, where the, uh, the two tails don't diverge. Which is why we, or if we want to sort of, if we have functions which aren't perfect like that, where the tails aren't uh, on top of each other, then we add in a delta. And this just means that we can accommodate for an additive difference. So we have this case where um, the delta on the side is the case where we have an output, but it would, we would have never have got that output if we had trained on D, which means the one um, instance that we, the one, yeah, the one instance that we removed from this database has actually made quite a big difference in this small minority in the, of this case, in the, in the tail on the right of D prime, um, and we call this this space delta. So this is like a catastrophic failure. So why is it good? So it doesn't matter how, like, like cryptography, well, no, not like cryptography. cryptography. Um, it doesn't matter, this is going to be private no matter what post-processing you're going to be doing on this data. And it's composable, which means I can account for the epsilon value, which is like the, 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 the metric of our privacy, um, as we go over multiple queries. Um, and this is, this is just really powerful because it allows us to do this in an algorithmic way. Um, we can also sum these at the end, and it just, yeah, just lets us to have this, this one um, epsilon. And no matter if, if I do some kind of differentially private operation, because remember, this is just a proof. There's, there's multiple ways to achieve differential privacy. If I do this upstream in the data processing path, then anything after this dif differentially private operation remains differentially private. So we don't have these solutions which are so um, tailored to a particular scenario, like, for example, take away the, um, the certainty factors. We can prove that something is private a while back, and we can leave in the certainty factors afterwards. And it's still going to be differentially private. Nope. So how do we make a differentially private algorithm? Typically, in the most simplistic cases, we add some noise. And this can be Gauss, from a Gaussian distribution, which is, which is fine, and it's sort of typical in statistics. Or we can do it from a Laplacian distribution. And this is kind of favored in differential privacy because it has these really tall spires. So the areas where there isn't an overlap are kind of minimized in a sense. But then how do we do machine learning in a differentially private way? We want to create predictions which are kind of slightly, slightly at least independent of our input data. So there's this um, quite good um, project that was done by an undergraduate student. I think it was maybe MIT or something like that, um, where they changed the optimizer of our, um, of our like, model. And this is where it previously comes back into a bit of use. 
because, um, yeah, we create gradients when we do this training process, when we, have the, we compute the error in relation to the input data and the, and the weights of the uh, pr like pr model parameters. So these are gradients here. We have this direction. Instead of updating using the original gradient, we clip it, and then we put another um, direction, just a little bit of noise going somewhere else. So it's difficult to know whether that update came from this original piece of information, because it's just that bit of ambiguity. So this is just a way that's super simple. We can just, every, every model that we create, let's say in PyTorch, has an optimizer, and we can easily just pull this from a library. We don't have to understand it. We can just use it and be assured that at, at some cost of sort of accuracy, in this case, um, we are um, slightly more private. So this is a slightly more complex one, and this is Patty. This is more complex, but not necessarily more complex to implement, because again, there are libraries and toolkits which have been created already and verified already, which sort of work. And this is actually being taught by Andrew Trask, who was here earlier, on this Udacity course, which is free. Um, so the idea is we have this sensitive data, but then we split it into subsets. And we take our ensemble of classifiers again, and we train each unique classifier on a unique subset. And then we have some public um, synthetic data, or let's say we have some public data which just hasn't been labeled. And we want to use that as a differentially private data set. Um, we want to label it, but this is where we start to leak information. So what we do is we combine all the teachers' votes um, to label the prediction. Um, and then we can publish this new uh, data set as being labeled through this differentially private mechanism. And if we want to add a little bit more privacy, then we can add some of the noise to the voting mechanism when, or when we try and sum these teachers' votes. And if we still want to add some more noise, then we can only choose, or we could choose to just um, pick a subset and a random subset of these teachers at any one point we want to label an instance. So if any of this has been sort of interesting, then you can come, or I would recommend coming along to the next um, Scottish Open Mind Meetup, where we'll be discussing sort of tutorials and, and way, ways that you can get involved. Um, and maybe join the uh, Open Mind Slack, if you're interested at all in machine learning and privacy. Um, and if you just want to create, let's say, a Patty implementation for your own project, then there are plenty of tutorials that exist online, and you will be able to um, use these to help you out. So, are there any questions? Hey. Hey, what about the security of uh, the, the accuracy of the system if we use uh, a method like the Pate? So, um, I think Pate is harder to quantify how it's going to affect the, the, um, the accuracy. But I think there is generally an accepted uh, notion that as we minimize epsilon, which is where we're, when epsilon is minimized, it's more accurate. I mean, it's more private. As we minimize epsilon with most differentially private mechanisms, then it's going to become less accurate. So there is still that trade-off, but there are other benefits to differential privacy, like the composability uh, and so on. Uh, so Open Mind is not ready for production. <laughs> um, it's, it's, at the moment, it's a great environment to test sort of theories, but, and it's, but it's still very much in development. So like one, of the, one of the ways that you can get involved on, on our Git is actually pen testing the Open Mind setup so we can try and at one point get to the stage where, uh, where we can just have this as a um, plug and play library which we can just use in production. Thanks. <laughs>